Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time zone you are joining us from. Welcome to Climate Law and Governance Day 2022. We are delighted to have you online with us. With over 1,400 registrants, including nearly 600 from Egypt and North Africa. This is an extremely important COP, and we are together for implementation of the Paris Agreement. And today's day marks an important collaborative effort in that respect. It is really, we are delighted to have you with us on this momentous occasion. And my name is Tejas Rao. I am a PhD candidate and research assistant at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge and manager with the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. And I will be one of your masters of ceremony for the day. Over the course of today, you would have received a PDF containing Zoom links that you can use to join us for each individual session in which you are interested. You will also receive a reminder of these links five minutes prior to the start of each session, and you will be able to join throughout the day and participate with us on the Zoom link of your interest. As you know, we have this opening ceremony followed immediately by a high-level plenary after which we will go into separate Zoom links for each of the four concurrent sessions. We have four parallel sessions running throughout the day in four different blocks. And at the end of that, we have two high-level plenaries before which we have the closing, after which we have the closing ceremony and the announcement of the Global Climate Law and Governance Awards for 2022. Without further ado, I would now like to introduce you to the chairs of the opening ceremony. Professor Marie-Claire cordonier Segal is Senior Director of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law and Executive Secretary of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative at the UNFCCC COP27. She is full professor of law at the University of Waterloo and Levy Hume Trust visiting professor at the University of Cambridge. Alongside her, we have Dr. Ahmed Khalifa, who is Assistant Professor of Law at the Ain Shams University in Egypt. He is Director of the International Relations and Academic Collaboration Office as well as the Deputy Secretary General of the International Association of Penal Law. Over to you. Thank you very much. I would like to especially thank our colleagues who have joined us online, the experts, judges, and esteemed international leaders in the emerging field of climate law and governance, which links to environmental law, human rights law, and economic law in important and intertwined ways on a foundation of rule of law, which we all stand for together with justice. This meeting, indeed this D, is a very important occasion during a COP that is focused on implementation. Indeed, our theme for the day this year is implementing climate commitments through policy law and practice. And you will see a strong focus on practice throughout the day. Practice in international organizations, practice on the ground, and also how to teach, research, and understand practice. Because the capacity that is needed to implement the commitments of the Paris Agreement is still so far from where it needs to be. And with climate change impacts already being felt around the world with wildfires, sea levels rising, desertification advancing, and glaciers melting and coral reefs drying out, we are in a state of climate emergency. And that capacity to address it in the law and policy is still so far from where it needs to be. So we are very, very happy that here together with us are so many leaders in our field, so many courageous and hardworking individuals who are trying to put their efforts to address the justice challenge of our century. Climate law, policy and practice must be strengthened to reduce emissions and keep the world below 1.5 degrees warming, to foster adaptation and resilience for the adverse impacts of climate change, to foster low greenhouse gas emissions, sustainable development pathways, and to make finance flows consistent 
with that pathway. Over 169 of 186 countries stress the importance of legal and institutional reform in their nationally determined contributions to the global response to climate change under the Paris Agreement. And over 60 countries also emphasized in their NDCs that exponential increases in law and governance capacity and practice on all levels are crucial for implementation and compliance. We can see together as international organization, council and directors, leading law faculties and law and governance institutes, government authorities and negotiators, law associations, judges and others responsible for inspiring, innovating and building climate law policy and governance capacity that there is a challenge of an enormous magnitude in front of us. We must face it with courage, with conviction and with commitment. And I'm very, very honored to be chairing this opening with individuals who in their lives, as well as in their professional work, have been doing exactly that. Today, we will be joined by Master Ayman Jerkawi, who is now director of the Hassan II International Center for Environmental Training, as well as lead counsel at the CISDL for um, uh, Climate Law and Governance, um, and, um, and deputy chair of the IUCN's World Commission on Environmental Law together with um, advocate Tejas Rao, who has just introduced us as our Masters of Ceremony. I'd like to thank and welcome them. I'd also like to thank and welcome Antonietta Nestor, Maeve McDermott, and Nick Scott, who are joining us at different moments online to help us with the online moderation of the day. And then especially, I would like to thank and turn over for a welcome um, the, the, the microphone to Dr. Ahmed Khalifa, with whom I have been working so closely over the last eight months preparing for the day, who is, of course, the representative of our partner institute, one of the most prestigious universities of Egypt, the Ain Shams University Faculty of Law in Cairo. Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Marie Claire. Dear uh, friends, colleagues, your honorable judges, ministers, academics, scholars from across all over the world. Good morning. I hope you are all doing good. In my name and on behalf of uh, Professor Mitaini, the president of Ain Shams University, we welcome you in this uh, Climate Law and Governance Day um, in Sharm Sheikh. We are online. Some of you are Sharm Sheikh. Uh, it's a great uh, event, and we are very uh, happy, honored to uh, be in partnership in uh, organizing uh, this event and being a co-host. Uh, this year, actually, uh, the subscribers for the event, as I heard from my colleagues, have reached a number that is uh, unprecedented, over 1,500 subscribers. And this gives, gives us a great uh, pleasure to, uh, to know that such a growing interest in the question of climate change in an area in the Middle East and across the world where, to be honest, the question of climate change was not present in uh, the debates and the ordinary life of people and even in the uh, academic, legal or policy circles. This growing interest is one uh, direct result of the threat that everyone is uh, aware of with the real climate change in the last two years. But it's also this growing interest is a result of efforts of uh, a lot of people who are working to reflect the importance of this question that I will not exaggerate to say that it's one of the very few incidents in history, if there are others that I'm not aware of, where the whole humanity is at threat. We are not talking about a challenge of certain region or a country or a continent or a certain race or ethnicity or any of the questions that the humanity have been dealing with and have been uh, challenged with in the past decades or centuries. We are really, and without exaggeration, facing a global threat, a threat to everyone that does not distinguish between the rich and the poor, between the educated and the uneducated, between 
uh, those who are in developed countries or those who are suffering in developing countries. This requires us all, and here I'm not saying only scholars, legal scholars, or politicians, or diplomats, or uh, officials, uh, to reach or to level up to the duty that is uh, on our shoulders, the duty to reach solutions, compromises, without looking with the small eye of the direct interest of each group of people represented in a country or a region or whatever. I know it's, it's very hard. It's, I know that it's not easy to reach, but I think that in such in initiatives like ours that are independent, that are aiming at uh, really proposing feasible solutions and uh, I would say neutral solutions that are not representing uh, interests, we have a huge responsibility of discussing, examining, and turning the topic that has not only uh, political, economic, social, but it has humanitarian uh, weight. And this is our duty, and I'm sure that we are all in this day and in other initiatives, and that's what we hope for, we are going to level up to this duty, and we are going to take the question of climate change uh, seriously in our circles, whether it's an academic circle or a diplomatic circle or a legal circle. And we have, you can see uh, from the very rich program that we have, and that I thank a lot of people that I will not name because it will take so much time that work to put it together, and a lot of institutions that presented their efforts to coordinate sessions. We have over than 20 sessions, and for this year, as far as I know, we have also uh, tried to go a step further by offering one session in Arabic to reach for our audience in the Middle East where that were absent from this uh, debate, the technical debate, if they don't have languages, English or French or other languages. So we have a session in Arabic and we are also happy to say from the very beginning of the day that for the plenary sessions, we will have translations from English to Arabic. This is not only a logistic question, this is a matter uh, that shows that we want really everyone to hear us. We want everyone to get concerned and we want everyone to be part of the solution because the problem touches us all. All the best of luck for uh, you all. We thank you for being with us as speakers, guests and moderators and chairs and rapporteurs. And uh, I really hope that uh, we all enjoy the day as much as we enjoyed working for this day. Thank you very much. Warm Mr. Thanks, and thank you again also to you and to Ayn Shams University, who have been such a marvelous partner in this initiative. Thank you. Now, I will ask if Sarah and Allah, who are online and assisting us with translation in Arabic, can uh, share in the chat function that people can see the instructions for accessing the Arabic translation. I'm hoping that on your keyboard, sharing that information in Arabic would be most effective. And uh, I would also like to underline that the themes for today, each of which has been led by a member of the program committee who has chaired their theme, are operationalizing the Paris Agreement, um, the international law aspects, exploring the challenges and opportunities of market and non-market mechanisms, transparency frameworks, compliance, loss and damage, and other aspects, as well as other relevant international legal instruments. Then also three domestic law themes, testing legal and governance in tools for high ambition and implementation at the national and local level, advancing climate resilience and climate justice, which engages civil society and especially looks at loss and damage this year, and net zero legal frameworks to enable climate neutral investment and finance, which course engages our commercial and private law colleagues across the board. The objectives of the day are to inspire and optimize legal and institutional reform for achieving the NDCs and the Paris Agreement, 
to share and profile international, national, and local law and governance challenges, to catalyze knowledge exchange and co-generate new climate law and governance scholarship insights and approaches, facilitating new dialogue and partnerships, and to strengthen capacity and collaboration among practitioners and a broader global community of practice in our area in order to implement the Paris Agreement and especially uh, in the context of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. With these extremely important objectives and these crucial themes, we are incredibly honored to be joined by international leaders in our field who have agreed kindly to open this day. And I would like to, in particular at this moment, welcome and introduce four of those leaders who are online with us, starting, of course, with our very own Professor Patricia Kameri Mabote, who is well known in our community as an intellectual leader, also as a teacher and professor, and also, of course, as the chair and executive of many national and international bodies, but has also now joined us as the director of law for the United Nations Environment Program. Patricia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the generous introduction, uh, uh, Marie. And uh, I'm very happy actually to be amongst uh, friends and colleagues and to be addressing this Climate Law and Governance Day this year. For me, it seems like only yesterday since we had the last Climate Law and Governance Day at COP26. And even though it looks like only yesterday, the gravity of uh, the issue that we address uh, in this day is actually extremely critical and coming on the heels of a very devastating climatic uh, space that we are working in. And we at UNEP uh, have been looking at the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution with all of you. And we know that this is putting our economic and social well being at risk, and also putting us at risk of irreversibly changing our relationship with the natural world. But today, I think as we gather as a legal community to exchange experiences and ideas, I would like us to talk about actions and solutions. There's been too many bad news. Last week, UNEP released the 2022 edition of its emissions gap report. And that report examines the gap between the emission the reductions promised and the emission reductions needed to achieve the temperature goal of the Paris Agreement. It revealed that despite the call for countries to revisit and strengthen their 2030 targets, progress since COP26 is highly inadequate. And this lack of progress leaves the world on a path towards a temperature rise far above the Paris Agreement goal of well below two degrees centigrade. In fact, policies currently in place without further strengthening suggest a 2.8 degree centigrade height, uh, which would jeopardize life on this planet as we know it. In the words of our executive director, Inga Anderson, we are sliding from climate crisis to climate disaster. The UN Secretary General Guterres has been even more graphic and opined that humanity is on the highway to climate hell. We are in the fight for our lives and we are losing it. To get back on track to meeting the Paris Agreement goal, the world needs to reduce greenhouse gases by unprecedented levels over the next eight years. And this requires immediate and ambitious uh, uh, actions to prevent drastic impacts tomorrow. What is certain is that actions taken by governments will necessitate legal and policy changes that are aligned with environmental rule of law. In the sixth assessment report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found that inclusive governance and legal reforms with a focused attention on strengthening justice, equity and gender considerations will be critical in reducing climate-related uh, risks. 
Solutions that reduce vulnerability must be gender responsive and undertaken with inclusive engagement of the most vulnerable and encompass civil society and the private sector and also government with an especially important role played by local government in partnership with local communities. The role of civil society in bringing about governance reform cannot be understated. Uh, citizens across the globe are holding their governments accountable to their, for their actions or inactions on climate change. Individuals are seeking relief from international tribunals, national courts, and other adjudicatory bodies against governments for failing to adequately reduce their carbon emissions or take actions to adopt to climate change. Such cases are being filed in jurisdictions all over the world and are increasingly being grounded in international as well as national constitutional human rights and obligations. And it has not stopped there. Private businesses are also being held to account for their carbon emissions and even for their lack of compliance with the Paris Agreement, where governments have been slow to do so, children and youth women's groups, local communities, indigenous peoples, and non-governmental organizations, among others, are driving climate change governance reforms in and around the world. The landmark resolution of the United Nations General Assembly in July this year, recognizing that everyone has the, on the planet has a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is only likely to embolden such action. States, international organizations, businesses, and other stakeholders all have a role to play. The resolution calls upon these and other stakeholders to scale up their efforts to ensure the fulfillment of these human rights. UNEP has been working with all stakeholders to develop and implement actions to tackle the planetary crisis, including climate. Under the fifth Montevideo Program for the Development and Periodic Review of Environmental Law, national focal points representing countries worldwide recently identified key priority areas for implementation under the program. Action on climate, biodiversity and pollution, and waste management are front and center of these priorities. The Montevideo Program promotes the development and implementation of environmental rule of law, through supporting the development of adequate and effective environmental legislation and legal frameworks, strengthening the effective implementation of environmental law at the national level, and supporting capacity building for increased effectiveness of environmental law for all stakeholders. The law division at UNEP, which I head, has been providing training and knowledge to countries on policies, regulations, and strategies to prevent or reduce marine litter and plastic waste. Following the historic resolution at uh, the UN Environment Assembly this year to end plastic pollution and forge an international legally binding agreement by 2024, UNEP has also been supporting the Secretariat for the International Intergovernmental and, uh, Negotiating Committee on Plastic Pollution to ensure the upcoming negotiations result in meaningful progress toward development of the new instrument. UNEP also launched a guide for policymakers on environmental courts and tribunals designed to support stakeholders in improving the adjudication of environmental disputes. And in celebrating 40 years of the Montevideo program, UNEP also had a 24-hour environment, 24 environmental rule of law celebration, which uh, was um, participated in by judges, decision makers, legal academics, practitioners, and other stakeholders worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, what the recent emissions gap report makes clear is that the window to take action on climate change uh, is closing. Uh, the World Resources Institute State of Climate Action Report similarly makes that point, noting that climate action must progress three to 10 times faster to have the emissions by 2030. Incremental change is no longer an option. Every fraction of a degree matters. 
for women and girls, for vulnerable people, for indigenous peoples and younger generation. As lawyers, we may wonder what can we do to deal with this seemingly insurmountable problem. I leave you with a message I shared with the African Society of International Law uh, in, just before the COP began. Uh, and it's inspired by the late Nobel laureate Wangari Mathai's hummingbird stories. It is about a huge forest being consumed by a fire. All the animals in the forest come out and they are transfixed as they watch the forest burning. And they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless, except this little hummingbird picking water with its beak and spewing it on the fire. Other animals ask sarcastically, what do you think you're doing? The hummingbird says, I am going to do something about the fire and I'm doing all I can. Let us all do what we can despite the enormity of the task. So I am looking forward to learning from you, your experiences, your successes, and even your challenges in promoting law and governance on climate change and how we can use these lessons to do even more. With this, I wish you all fruitful discussions and a successful event. Thank you. Warmest of thanks for that wonderful opening keynote, Professor Patricia Kameri Mubote. And thank you also to the United Nations Environment Program for doing all you can for so many years. You are a very valued and very deeply respected partner. Other partners have joined us online as well to help us to open this conference. And I'm very, very honored to welcome a dear friend for many years and a fellow of our center for many years, who is of course, Professor Christina Voigt, chair now of the IUCN's World Commission on Environmental Law, having hosted us just recently in Oslo for an incredibly incredibly inspiring conference of the Commission, and of course also co-chair of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee, the PAIC or PIKE, as well as of course a full professor of international law at the University of Oslo, which I can say firsthand is a very beautiful and august and eminent international location. Christina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marie Claire, for your kind introduction and a very warm hello and welcome to everyone joining us online here today from uh, the World Commission on Environmental Law. And many, many thanks to you, Marie Claire, and your team for organizing again this fabulous Climate Law and Governance Day this year online to be inclusive and enable everyone to participate. Thank you, thank you so much. You are a cornerstone every year in the global discourse on climate law and governance. Well, dear friends, uh, we all know that the goals of the Paris Agreement are our guiding lights in the question of where the world needs to go, uh, at least within the next couple of years until 2050 and beyond. But we also know that the goals of the Paris Agreement are still out of reach. We are not on track, uh, neither the climate uh, temperature goal nor the adaptation goal, nor the finance goal are anywhere close to be met. Of course, this is the whole structure of the Paris Agreement. It is in, to, in order to enable global progress to reaching those goals, but we are far from being there yet. And we also do know that in order to achieve those goals, all three of them, temperature goal, adaptation goal, the finance goal, in order to achieve them, what is needed is a global transformation or transformative change which needs to cut across all sectors values paradigms pretty much everything we do because the bottom line here is that business as usual will not get us there and in this global transformation what is absolutely crucial is the role and the rule of law because law is the governance tool to get societies, individuals, companies, decision makers to make 
the right decisions and to enable them to do the right, right things on the ground. Just an example, we all know that the Paris Agreement obliges parties to communicate nationally determined contributions, NDCs, every five years. But that's a formal requirement. It's a formal process. Implementing them and achieving them is a matter of national laws and regulations. This is even written in the Paris Agreement that states or parties shall uh, take national implementation measures to uh, achieve the objectives in their NDCs. Now, what is needed, as I said, is that regulatory response to the overall threat of climate change. And in some cases, we have responses through climate acts and climate laws, and these are necessary. But it's not only a climate act that can be the only response to the, the overall threat of climate change. What is really needed is creating the legal system, the legal structure, the domestic legal framework that enables a sustainable, fair, low greenhouse gas emission and climate resilient development across all sectors. And that involves all areas of law, private law, constitutional law, public law, human rights law. Patricia was just speaking to the need to be uh, inclusive and, and have wide participation in decision-making, including indigenous peoples, local communities. But that requires a legal system and not just the singular law that is attuned and aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Now, we know that this is not an easy task. In fact, it is an unprecedented task. The IPCC is very clear in that, that the global transformation or transition that needs to happen is unprecedented in scope. Maybe not in speed. Humans have been ingenious over time and they can react quickly. But in terms of the scope, the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing, it is an unprecedented task. And I'm sure we will be able to overcome it, but it needs all hands on deck. And in particular, the legal hands in terms of crafting the right legislation, in terms of having effective implementation and compliance and enforcement, having the courts involved in this, uh, in this discourse, judges being informed and enlightened about the science behind climate change, the need of regulatory interventions and the, the task in, in, ahead of us. So what we're seeing is maybe we've entered the era of law. Science is clear, the political guidance is there, but the tools are not yet entirely aligned with what is needed in order to, to achieve uh, at least the goals of the Paris Agreement, as well as the sustainable development uh, goals. So having entered the era of, era, era of law, or not era, era of law, is maybe the, the overall theme uh, for this conference as well, for the uh, Climate Law and Governance Day uh, 2022. And it is well uh, aligned with the overall theme of the COP, which is implementing together, together in, in, for implementation. And that involves very squarely the role and the role of laws, of lawyers. Thank you so much, Marie Claire, and back to you. Or Mr. Thanks, and thank you especially to the IUCN's World Commission on Environmental Law, which, like the United Nations Environment Program, has been a valued and honored partner in this initiative since its inception in 2005 in the Montreal COP11, which was, of course, also first meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol after it entered into force. I'm now very, very pleased to introduce and welcome another dear old friend and powerful woman leader intellectually as well as on the ground in this field, Dr. Ilaria Bottigliero. Ilaria has an extremely impressive academic and intellectual leadership in this field, and she's also the voice of rule of law in the international community as research director of the International Development Law Organization. Ilaria, the floor is yours. 
Oh, thank you so much, Marie Claire, for your really, really generous words. And uh, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. It's an honor, in fact. I am I'm really pleased to be part of this important day on, on behalf of IDLO and uh, to discuss how rule of law, policies, and good governance can accelerate climate action and contribute to a healthier planet. Now, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Cordonia Seger, of course, Marie Claire, uh, Dr. Khalifa, and all of the organizers of this impressive and wonderful gathering and, and so much needed uh, at COP and beyond. Uh, needed because uh, climate change, uh, as we all know, represents the single largest threat to sustainable development and has been identified by many as the most pressing challenge of our time. Uh, as a cross-cutting issue with disproportionate effects on vulnerable and marginalized people, climate change is not just an environmental or ecological concern. It undermines progress towards human rights and sustainable development, and it poses an existential threat to the future of life on our planet, as many of you have already underlined. At IDLO, the only global intergovernmental organization exclusively devoted to enhancing the rule of law, we believe that the causes and effects of climate change are inextricably linked to issues of justice and equity. As such, justice issues must be part of the solution to achieve a fair, inclusive, and climate secure future for people and the planet. The harmful consequences of climate change are actually more keenly felt by those who are the most dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods. Those with the least capacity to respond and adapt to natural hazards, and those more excluded from the exercise of power. Ambitious climate action, which links human rights and sustainable development is needed to tackle the pre-existing vulnerabilities and inequalities that both contribute to and are exacerbated by climate change. So at IDLO, we reflected on these issues and our climate justice strategy to which I'm pleased to say quite a few of the experts present today have contributed with you know, uh, great generosity. Our climate justice strategy focuses on climate justice, a concept we use to describe a wide range of legal and policy approaches to addressing climate change and which we will discuss, of course, more in, de of course, more in depth uh, in follow-up sessions later today. At the core of climate justice is the realization that any solution to tackle climate change needs to be based at least on four fundamental premises. Now, first of all, linking human rights and development to tackle pre-existing vulnerabilities and inequalities contributing to and exacerbating climate change. Second, we do need to prioritize the most climate vulnerable to ensure that no one is left behind. Three, we need to ensure fair and inclusive climate decision-making particularly for people and groups traditionally excluded from such processes. And finally, we need to invest in people-centered laws and institutions to enable ambitious climate action while equitably distributing costs and benefits of climate mitigation and adaptation measures. Inclusive, equitable and effective laws good governance, policies and institutions capable of responding to climate change are a necessary prerequisite for climate resilience societies, development, and for advancing the objectives of all 17 sustainable development goals in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. 
So at IDLO to make this theory, let's say into practice, because we are a, a practical and hands-on organization working mostly in the field, we concentrate our work on three main pillars. The first one, we do try to empower the most climate vulnerable people to realize environmental rights and actively participate in decision-making processes. We support them, especially women and girls, to claim and defend their environmental rights and contribute to policy making. But we also promote indigenous rights over land and support indigenous livelihoods to reduce poverty. We also think that uh, it is essential to invest in people-centered laws and institutions for climate resilient development. So we're trying to secure prospects uh, for ensuring that justice institutions, both formal and informal, have the capacity to deliver on the promise of climate justice. So we work very closely with institutions. We also think that as the international community steps up its effort for climate financing, the rule of law can be a powerful enabler of national and global finance mechanisms to support the transition to a carbon-free future. And finally, improving governance of land and other natural resources, it's also a part, a great part of our work because we believe that the rule of law can improve inclusive governance and land of natural resources, enabling the conditions for peace and sustainable development. And we also try to establish fair legal mechanisms for environmental protection that can promote the equitable distribution of benefits of natural resources in ways that reduce conflict overall, because we really believe that the rule of law can give a practical contribution to reducing conflict that are uh, exacerbated by the climate crisis. So to conclude, climate justice is in our hands. So at IDLO, we stand ready to work with all of you, all partners, towards a fair, inclusive, and climate secure future for people and the planet. So we're ready to do our part. Thank you so much, Marie Claire, and the organizers of this wonderful day. And back to you. Thank you very much and warmest of thanks, especially for the essential efforts of the International Development Law Organization in the struggle to respond to the existential survival threat of climate change, which affects the most vulnerable worst and first. Your efforts are deeply appreciated, Ilaria, both for your organization, but also your work as a leader in this field. I'm now very, very honored to introduce a speaker from the global financial community who has become a friend over the years in this process and has been an extremely esteemed and valued partner of the D since Paris in 20, um, 2015. And we are very happy to have him with us today especially given the time that he has kindly stayed awake for. And so uh, without further ado, Advocate Douglas Lee's King's Council, General oh. Council of the Green Climate Fund, often in Songdo, Korea, coming and joining us online. Welcome, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. And I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, I should say colleagues online, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Green Climate Fund and certainly on behalf of my fellow hosts this morning for the staging of Climate Law and Governance Day under the theme, Implementing Climate Commitments Through Policy, Law and Practice. The program, as you will no doubt have seen, is a very rich and diverse one, which embodies the theme. I would like to extend my gratitude to the organizers for putting this together so well. 
as a representative of one of the main vehicles created by the UNFCCC to see to the implementation of climate commitments, there is nowhere else I'd rather be this morning. At the GCF, I'm proud to say that we have been forging ahead with our mandate. We have been de-risking investment to mobilize finance at scale, for example, working with private equity funds on blended finance initiatives for the SIDS and the LDCs. We are working to align finance with sustainable development through support to the governor, government of Jamaica to set up a Caribbean green bond listing on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And you'll hear more or other like initiatives of this in a later session. Now, I refer to these examples to say that our work is just commencing. As the climate emergency unfolds and manifests itself in different ways, the GCF is facing even more challenges. The GCF is now at a crossroads in its development as an institution. Do we continue to do business as usual, or do we reinvent ourselves to take on the climate emergency? Indeed, we have been mandated by the COP on our board to, click to scale up climate finance even more. The GCF is now being challenged to take on a more catalytic role in the field of climate finance and find ways of harnessing the trillions of private sector resource, financial resources, which is the only way we'll be able to get a handle on this crisis. These are challenges we face considering the unfolding climate emergency. We at the GCF, we are prepared for the challenge. We have embarked on a very robust program of catalyzing and leveraging private finance through innovative programs and funding, some of which I'll present in a later session. We are going full steam ahead with our mandate. In the Office of General Counsel, we are doing our part, and I want to encourage the legal fraternity to join us. As lawyers, we will have to provide inputs into policies which have to be more accommodative. We have to ensure that we instill in our young lawyers the legal engineering skills, which will have to be creative in how we interpret and fulfill the provisions of some of our respective constituent documents. They weren't designed to deal with an emergency. And we have to be innovative in how we interpret and apply the provisions so that we get a handle on the emergency. Our legal arrangements for projects will have to be bold in how we put them together. We cannot continue as business as usual. The emergency will engulf us all. In closing, I want to assure you today that while we extol some of our accomplishments in later sessions, we will be careful to take note of the issues which you have raised, both panelists and especially the audience. And we will certainly embed them in our thinking and how we discharge our mandate going forward. I want to use this opportunity of wishing this is symposium all the very best. And I'm sure that like past events, this one will be a resounding success. Thank you, Chair, and over to you. Thank you very, very much, Douglas. And thank you for your unwavering support over the years, your substantive contributions, your generosity and guidance, and especially your willingness to be with us often until three o'clock in the morning your time, which is above and beyond the call of duty and deeply appreciate it. Our last in-person speaker before we go to a short video from Justice Antonio Benjamin and then move directly to our initial opening high-level plenary on securing climate justice through the courts. And I would like to especially recognize that Honorable Justice Michael Wilson, Honorable Justice Luis Roberto Barroso, and Honorable Justice Adil Majed have joined us online already and we'll be moving to their plenary shortly. But our certainly not least, but most recent 
partner and collaborator in this initiative who has joined us online today is Professor Hajar Gildish, who is, of course, not only a renowned international law professor at the University of Carthage in Tunisia, but also for the African Union, the chair of the Commission for International Law, which has become an essential partner in this initiative. We deeply appreciate her joining us online, and we would like to ask you to say just a few words of welcome on behalf of your crucial work here in Africa. Professor Hatcher. Thank you so much, dear colleague and professor, for your kind words. Good morning to everyone, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a honor for me to take part to this important event today. I sincerely thank the organizers of the conference for allowing all of us to be part of this high level initiative to examine the climate change as a disaster that is reversing, as you said, gains made for human rights in the world and especially in Africa, to include the African Union response in the climate change discourse and to spur urgent policy and actions. So in my capacity as a chairperson of AUCL, I would like just briefly to introduce our organ. It was established in 2009 as an independent adversary body of the African Union. It is composed of 11 elected members and our role is the codification and the progressive development of international law at the African level. Now concerning the legal framework of the African environment law, maybe it is emergent, but it begins since the 70s. So this is 50 years ago. The African environment law has involved and had been developed in response to newly established international environment instruments. This led to the adoption of the first Environment Continental Convention under the auspices of the Organization of the African Unity, which is the predecessor, the predecessor of the African Union. And the first convention was established in 1967, and it is named the Fito Salutary Convention for Africa. After that, the second convention is the Alge Convention. It is the African Convention for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, and it was adopted in 1968. Other conventions and other protocols followed. Inter Alia, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights of 1982, and this includes the third generation of human rights, like the right of environment and sustainable development. After that, we have the Bamako Convention on the ban of the import into Africa and the control of transboundary movement and management of hazardous waste within Africa of 1991. We have also the protocol relating to the establishment of the Peace and the Security Council of the African Union of 2002. We have also the revised African Convention on the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resource of 2003. We have the African Union Convention on the uh, Protection and Assistance of Internally Displaced Persons in Africa, which is called the Kampala Convention of 2009. We have the revised African Maritime Transport Charter of 2010, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe all this framework is not very well known at the African level, is not very well known. So thank you to give me the opportunity to introduce it. And in parallel, there is a lot of actions. And uh, maybe I can just give you some examples. Given the abundance of natural resources on the African continent, the environmental protection and conservation must be a top priority for the African Union and its member states. Moreover, um, concerns about the environment and the natural resources in Africa are high on Africa's continental and national priorities at the moment. So the environment must be an overriding objective to figure out how African Union environmental law will help the world achieve sustainable development. As a matter of fact, the environment issues are part and the pillars of the Agenda 2063. Moreover, African Union made developments in issuing policies, guidelines in environment such 
the Nairobi Declaration on the African Process for Combating Climate Change, such um, declaration on climate change and development in Africa, such the decision on the high level work program on climate change action in Africa. And this is an indication that the African Union efforts go beyond adapting legal instruments, but it continues to combat all illegal activities that are affecting the continent through means to implement them. More recently, in February 2022, and this is very recent, the African Union endorsed the continent's first collective climate response framework. It is called the African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plan. It is for 10 years, and it begins this year, 2022, till 2032. It was released at the end of June 2022, and it comes at a time of growing evidence that Africa is one of the most vulnerable regions to the impacts of climate change. This is due to high exposure to climate hazards, reliance on climate sensitive sectors and low adaptive capacities. The African Union's 10 years strategy planning document I think is a very important first step for mapping out a harmonized regional response to climate change to improve Africa's adaptive capacity and unlock long-term transformative, low emission, climate resilient development, et cetera, et cetera. However, we think that making a strategy is a reality across the continent that will require a wide range of stakeholders to overcome the resource, capacity, institutional barriers of moving from planning the implementation. I will finish now by telling that I sincerely hope that this conference can give rise to recommendations that may address inter alia the absence of human rights-based approach to climate action, as well as the absence of effective legal remedies for climate change-related harm, addressing the impact of climate change on human rights in Africa, however, necessitates a collaborative effort on the part of all stakeholders. I think there is still a lot of challenges and there is a lot that has been done to be done. I appreciate too much the program of this conference. I'm here to learn today a lot. The number of participants is really impressive, but also the number of the speakers. Congratulations for all your efforts and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so, so much, Hajar. We do have two videos to play, but we will play Justice Antonio Benjamin at the end of the judges plenary, which is about to start right now. I see we've been joined online. Um, and we will be playing um, Professor Chris Chinkin from the International Law Association as part of the closing. So I will pass to advocate Ayman Turkawi, who was introduced at the beginning and is, of course, the other master of ceremonies for this conference to introduce directly the high level plenary on securing climate justice through the courts with all of my warmest thanks to our speakers. And Ahmed, you might also wish to thank our speakers and our opening plenary before we pass to Ayman. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And I thank you on- Hello, the everyone. For the uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. No, just I wanted to thank everyone on behalf of Ancient University and Professor oh, Metheny. Please go ahead, sorry. Sure. Um, no, 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 sorry, it's fine. We are please already, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, it was just 15 seconds uh, welcoming again and thank you for being with us, all the uh, respectable uh, speakers and all the audience. And I will pass it immediately to uh, dear colleague Ayman Sharawi to, to start our uh, plenary first plenary session, which to which we are late for four minutes. So let's not make that five. Thank you. Uh, hello, sorry, thank you very much. Apologies, I, I, um, um, I had some difficulties with the sound. As you can hear, I'm swimming and see, I'm in the blue zone uh, of the UNEP of the COP27. So, uh, such uh, apologies for the misunderstanding just now. So, Ahlan wa Salam, hello everyone. Uh, what an amazing start to our session and day it has been with this particularly impressive set of speakers. 
uh, very honored to uh, ensure the transition between this opening session and the next one. We have heard uh, about the importance of the science policy interface. We have heard about this new era of law. We have heard about climate change being the most pressing challenge of our time and across cutting issues. Uh, climate justice is in our hand, as we say in Arabic, al-adala al mumakhiya we have heard about the important fund, the work of the Green Climate Fund, the blended finance and the alignment of finance with sustainable development. We have also heard and was particularly pleased uh, as a Morocco, as, a, as this COP is taking place in Africa from Hajar about this voyage through time regarding the development of African environmental law and an African perspective on these issues. Now, as we move to the next session, um, it, I think it's really fitting to connect with the uh, opening remark from His Excellency Sisi when he indicated that COP27 was to be named the Shah Sheikh Implementation Summit. And in that regard, this next session, looking at securing climate justice through the pools, this high level plenary that will be chaired by Dr. Gretel Aguila, Deputy Director General in the IUCN, with tremendous experience in these different issues. I'm very much looking forward to it, and I hope you join me in this excitement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eamon. It is nice to see you all. So, honorable judges, lawyers, colleagues, and friends, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to begin by thanking the organizers, um, Professor Marie Claire Cordonier, thank you for the invitation, University of Cambridge, the Egyptian Aim Champs University in Cairo, and all the partners that made this event possible. It is my pleasure to share the first level plenary of the Climate Law and Governance Day under the title, Securing Climate Justice Through the Courts. Uh, this is an, an event that follows on the recent results of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law Conference held in Oslo last October. The panel will consider two key questions. How are courts responding to the challenge of climate change around the world? And what is the role of the judiciary in addressing this threat for humanity and nature in a just manner? This question goes straight to the heart of why we need law. We need law to ensure that everyone gets access to justice they deserve. Some also might ask why we need the course when it comes to climate change. The reasons are simple. Climate change is one of the biggest global threats facing us today and will touch every corner of the planet. Such vast problems need solutions from all stakeholders, and this includes lawyers and courts around the world. Furthermore, even though we have known for decades about the threats posed by climate change, political action, political, uh, political action has been slow. With such a pressing threat for our futures and livelihoods, we need all mechanisms available to us to speed up the process before it is too late. Courts are called to address injustice, look for equity, help us to achieve human rights and the protection of environment in a climate crisis. Indeed, I will say that courts, with the power they hold, are responsible to tackle climate change. This is not an academic discussion. By 2021, courts worldwide heard at least 1,500 litigation cases, and the climate crisis continued to grow, so the number of cases at courts. We today know that climate litigation plays a fundamental role in achieving climate justice. Citizens, including indigenous people, organizations, communities, private sectors and governments are looking for ways to achieve the so desired um, right, uh, the right to a healthy environment and also to achieve climate justice. And courts can and need to play a, 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 role, a fundamental role. They need to give us hope and they need to take us to action in a world where we have climate justice. I will stop here and, and, and give the floor to three esteemed justice that are with us today. With their diverse geographical backgrounds, they will each bring valuable viewpoints to broaden our understanding on the legal professional roles and responsibilities. 
Let me uh, first have the privilege to introduce to you our first speaker, the Honorable uh, Justice Luis Roberto Barroso, Justice in the Supreme Federal Court of Brazil. Justice Barroso began uh, his term in 2013 and is also professor, uh, professor of the constitutional uh, law uh, at Rio de Janeiro State University. He also serves as president of the Superior Electoral, Electoral Court and has written over 12 books on Brazilian constitutional law, in addition to several dozen articles. Please, Honorable Justice uh, Luis Roberto Barroso, the floor is yours. You have six minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Gretel Aguilar. I'm very happy and pleased to be here. I gave my brief intervention the title Climate Litigation in the World and in Brazil, Pushing History. I uh, would like to divide my uh, presentation, uh, if, I, if, I, if I may, in three chapters. First one, reasons that legitimize the intervention of the judiciary. The second, the precedent established by the Brazilian Supreme Court on the statutes of the Paris Agreement. And third, the role of Supreme Courts and constitutional courts in dealing with lawsuits relating to the climate crisis. What's climate litigation? The so-called climate litigation refers to lawsuits or administrative procedures aimed mainly at obtaining decisions concerning the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, adaptation to the consequences of climate change, redress of environmental damages, environmental licensing, and climate risk management. Typically, these cases target both actions and inaction by governments or government agencies, although there are also examples of lawsuits brought against private par parties. It is impossible to dissociate climate litigation from the idea of climate justice, meaning the adequate distribution of responsibilities, costs, and consequences arising from climate change. No need to emphasize that climate change affects most dramatically the enjoyment of fundamental rights by the most vulnerable, whose rights to life, food, health, and housing are directly compromised. Reasons for judicial intervention. The two main factors that led courts to intervene in climate issues are, first, ignorance and denial, even in light of warnings from an almost unanimity of scientists. And second, a short-term vision that rules in politics, since the effects of carbon emissions and environmental degradation carried out today will only be felt by the next generations. The lack of incentives to the majoritarian politics. Oops. Hello. Yeah. I'm, I'm back. very sorry about that. You can continue, Justice Barroso. Okay. The lack of incentives to the majoritarian politics to act legitimizes action by courts whose members do not rely on votes and are not moved by the short-term goals of politics. There are, throughout the world, some emblematic judgments regarding climate change as the Urgenda case, the Shell case, and the recently Neubauer case. The views of the Brazilian Supreme Court. In a recent landmark case known as the Climate Fund case, the Brazilian Supreme Court decided first, matters involving environmental protection and the fight against climate change do not necessarily fall under the political question doctrine and are in many cases justiciable. Second, the Paris Agreement is a human rights treaty what under Brazilian law means it is below the constitution, but above 
ordinary legislation and administrative orders. And third, the Brazilian constitution states that a healthy environment is a fundamental right and that the government has the duty to protect it. However, Brazil was not honoring international commitments that it assumed and that were incorporated into domestic legislation. All these facts made it legitimate for the courts to intervene. And finally, the enlightening role of Supreme Courts. Besides its counter-majoritarian and representative roles, Supreme Courts and constitutional courts may also need to play an enlightening role, meaning the following. In rare but important situations, it's up to the courts in the name of the Constitution, international treaties, and universal values of justice to remedy the omissions that affect human rights, even in face of government's inaction and indifference of the majority of society. In many parts of the world, this has been the case with racial segregation, women's rights, and the rights of the LGBTI community, to name a few. Naturally, the courts are not capable of conducting this struggle in isolation, and government and society will always be essential for its success. But they have, the courts, in many cases, the ability to place the issue on the political agenda and in the public debate, forcing actions to be taken. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Justice uh, Barroso, and thank you for for enlightening us uh, with uh, with these uh, cases of the Brazil Supreme Court, especially when you said the the Paris Agreement as is a is a human right, and and also what you mentioned about the the right, you know the 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 need to protect the right to a healthy environment is very fundamental for all of us worldwide. So thank you very much for your intervention. Now let me um, give the floor to, to the second speaker, the Honorable Justice Adel Mahed, Vice President of the Egyptian Court of Cassation. Justice Mahed has 30, 30 years of professional experience in the field of criminal justice and adjudication, in addition to his many roles since beginning appointed as a public prosecutor in 1987. He has broad experience in comparative criminal justice, legislative drafting, and justice reform. Please, uh, Justice Mahed, the floor is yours. Good morning. Can you hear me well? Perfect. I'm very pleased, I'm very happy to be among these distinguished speakers and the practitioners this morning. Um, and for the sake of time, let me uh, address my, my, my topics directly. Um, I would like to address three main issues. First issue, how the Egyptian legal system perceive climate change and how the Egyptian legal system is prepared to deal with cases of climate change. Second issue, the impact of climate justice concept on our legal system. It's very important. And lastly, I would like to show some, some light on the development and the, the emerging system of um, climate justice law around the world and, and how some courts, European, especially European courts are dealing with climate justice and how we can benefit from this um, achievements, uh, as a matter of fact, and, and I, I will say the word achievement, especially when I'm talking about a very famous case in the Dutch uh, courts, Orhanda, Orhanda case, this is, this is a leap forward, I think. So let's start with the Egyptian legal system. First of all, it is very important to mention that the Egyptian constitution 
recognize international treaties and the international treaties are part of our domestic legislation uh, once it is ratified. It's very important uh, because we have many uh, environmental treaties and climate change treaties and we have, we have acceded and ratified many conventions on, on issues of environment law. Secondly, our court system is prepared even in its current status to address issues of climate change because we have a coherent strong legal system and court adjudication as well. For example, um, our court of cassation where I'm working, our Supreme Court, Constitution Supreme Court have already addressed many issues of um, environmental law. And in their judgments, they, they have already recognized um, international treaties, international norms, but in some incidents, when when we are we are in front of issues of criminalization and punishment, according to to the principle of legality, we have to have a criminal legislation addressing these issues, and so we have an environmental law, a long one, one hundred four articles, which we have a special chapter addressing environmental law pollution, for example, but whether it is this chapter is, is uh, it's sufficient to address new emerging issues of climate change, it is questionable. I think we need to update and to amend our law to address new, new principles, like the, the, the principle of, of common but uh, the differentiated responsibility, these issues, I think it needs, and, and, and the per percentage of, of uh, reduction of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, greenhouse emission, these issues need to be reviewed. And I think our whole legal system need to be reviewed to be uh, able to address emerging issues of climate change. Um, four months ago, I, I was, I, I, I am going to, to, to talk about climate justice now. Four months ago, I was asked by the State Information Service to write about climate justice because it is a debatable and arguable concept in Egypt. And, and many consider uh, climate justice as only a human right, it reflects human right issues. And as a matter of fact, when, when, when I, I studied on climate research and climate justice, climate justice is, is a huge concept. It's, it's emerging concept that is still crystallizing, crystallizing. But one point for our Arab world, our African countries, climate justice is on the side of our people here. Climate justice asks developing country to assist our um, nations in addressing issues of mitigation and adaptation as well. And as you can see from this slide, from this figure, this is my approach to climate justice. We have social and economic imbalances. This is, this is uh, I, I don't have to be the, the crisis that we are facing in, in, in the African content and, and what happens to, to, uh, to, to concerning drought and, and uh, heat waves, uh, but we have social imbalances, economic imbalances. The issue of climate justice really addresses these issues by relying on the historical responsibility principles provided on the legal framework on climate justice by relying on the principle of coming but differentiated responsibility. And the, the point here, when people talk about climate justice, it's climate justice, we need climate justice, but how we can enforce climate justice. He, he, here is the issue, here is the techniques. Uh, my perception is that the international legal framework have already provided us with our tools, which is equity, and equity is recognized in international law and, and by, 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 by the norm and principles of equity and justice, we can enforce climate justice. Um, as I mentioned, I would like to set some light on what is going on in Europe. And I am, I'm very pleased about what, what the Dutch courts are doing concerning addressing the issue of climate justice. I have received my postgraduate studies from from Holland and Holland and The Hague. Now they are the land of international law. And just in a very concise uh, 
uh, words. The Aruganta Gaze. The Aruganta Gaze is, is initiated by uh, a civil society and a group of people that around 900 people. They, they are only asking the state to abide to their pledges decreasing greenhouse emission. And it was a fantastic decision by, by the Dutch courts that they approved their, uh, their claims and, 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 and uh, they, they, they abide the states to abide to the international norms um, addressing uh, climate change. And I hope that our judges in the Arab world, in the African countries, in, in all developing countries should have a look at the emerging system of climate justice law uh, addressed by national, national jurisdictions in Europe and by the European Court of Human Rights. By this, I would like to conclude and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Maher, and thank you for your for your words. I I I believe that um, as you as you say, you know, ju climate justice is an emerging concept, but it's also, as you mentioned, a human rights. And what I captured from your presentation that uh, I confess really went to my heart is that uh, climate justice is on the side of people. And 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 that is about equity and justice, as you presented in your slide. So thank you very much for for your for your words. Um, with this, let me give now the floor to our third and last speaker, the Honorable Justice Michael Wilson, who is an associate justice in the Hawaii Supreme Court. Justice Wilson was appointed to the Hawaii Supreme Court in. 2014, and before that was a circuit court judge for 14 years. He is also a founding member of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. And prior to begin a uh, uh, judge, uh, he held multiple environmental roles, such as serving as director of the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, Justice Wilson, very nice to see you again. The floor is yours. Aloha, Greta. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Oh, very good. Well, whenever I see you, I'm in, I know I'm in the right place. Thank you so much for putting this together. And the same to Marie Claire. It's just a, a, been a wonderful presentation. I'm honored to be here with Justice Barossa, who I think I had the pleasure to meet and learn from in the past, and as well as Professor Sagar. And um, thank you much, so much for your remarks as well, Justice Mahed. So I would like to focus on this concept of securing climate justice uh, through the courts at a time of emergency. And a word that's being used now, a legal term that kind of helps describe the significance of the emergency is that it's sui generis. It's one of a kind, sui generis. To put in perspective what that means in terms of one of a kind, I think from the point of view of the global judicial community, we have a challenge. We are in an extraordinary and unprecedented position now as judges. And, and to frame it, um, at the last COP, you may recall, uh, Barack Obama addressed the progress since uh, 2015. And he expressed the point that our, the governing systems of the world aren't working and the degree of global warming is inconsistent with what was anticipated in 2015 at the Paris Agreement. Looks like we're gonna shoot beyond 1.5 degrees, but his message was that young people need to participate. And uh, the point that's been made by previous speakers about over a thousand climate cases being filed, the fact that over 100 cases have mentioned the Urgenda case that was described so articulately by Justice Mahed. These are facts that show that young people are starting to participate. Barack Obama's message is you have to participate by voting. I wish he had said that they should take their cases to court, I mean, uh, and given an endorsement of the rule of law, but I think that the rule of law, uh, I, I agree, agree with, with um, 
justice in my head is robust right now. It can serve as a, a basis for solutions that involve transformational change. But at the moment, completing the, the context of where we are, since November, we have had a, a statement made by the Secretary General that I'm here in India at the moment for conferences on uh, climate justice. And a number of times, his statement about how we're on a highway to climate hell, a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator is a way to say how heroic in a way the judges are, the position that they're in. Because with the assumption that the other branches of government can't get this quite under control, the courts have ended up with this enormous responsibility to, as you said, Greta, uh, you said there's a responsibility to act. And uh, with that said, let me see if I can uh, share the screen just for a moment to cover a couple of slides that are reflective of sort of where the courts are at this time. So this um, is a slide that depicts a coming moment of great importance in India, but certainly the world as well. And it is a statement that in about 40 years, over 100 million people are likely to leave, uh, are probably going to leave Bangladesh because of sea level rise. And as a consequence of that, we are in a situation in which the courts have had to contend with the issue at what we could call a hard law level in the trenches. So I went to Bangladesh because it's a lot like Hawaii. Our major cities being flooded and we've had some devastating events that have caused us to shut down one of our islands for over a year. All right, so in the United States, which has the largest carbon footprint, what's happening with the courts? Uh, with just the last month or so, we've had one of our extraordinary justices on the Supreme Court write a dissent where she talks about how the majority is engaging in frightening decision-making. The United States Supreme Court recently made a decision, as you know, that had to do with the ability of the government to regulate carbon and restricted it in a way that was inconsistent with their agenda, inconsistent with the Grand Sith case from France, inconsistent with many of the place, many of the jurisdictions on earth. So we're left in this situation with young people on the left, and you might say the status quo on the right. And they are challenged. And because of the decisions of our Supreme Court. We now have law students that are demonstrating on the steps of the Supreme Court. And we have young people, you'll recognize Greta Thunberg and the other individual as a young man who organized an international youth community joined with, uh, in many cases, mothers who are taking actions in court to stop global warming. And Greta, you're familiar with, I know this, uh, if you will, example of the fraying of the rule of law, because this is Edwin Choda, one of the great environmental defenders who was murdered some time ago. And his colleagues around the world, three or four of them are murdered every week. So the rule of law is challenged to the point where, and I, we are riding a tiger. The courts are riding a tiger called climate change. And there's no question, I think, that right now the courts have been able to exact certain principles in other places other than the United States. But I'll conclude by making the point that in Hawaii, we have decided a case in which we have found that the future generations have a right to a stable climate capable of supporting human life. So. The movement forward continues. It's continuing at a state level, and there's a separation with the federal level. But I thank you very much for your time, Greta, and, and all the participants. 
I, I see that Eamon Chikawi is here too, which is exciting from WCEL. I think uh, at this point, I'll just say aloha and uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the judicial community is on the front lines and I think we're capable of making a, a big difference in stopping global warming. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much, and, um, Justice uh, Wilson, especially for reminding us about the role of young people and, and environmental defenders. Young people are a source of hope and, and are definitely the ones who will carry the flag for many of us in the future and now. So thank you for reminding us that important part and also for reminding us how important our courts and, and how much responsibility courts have in their hands now with this uh, climate crisis. With that, let me just close the, the, uh, this panel. We are, we are just in time because I was giving the floor five minutes late. <laughs> so, but uh, without you, um, uh, honorable judges, it will have been impossible to close this uh, panel in, in 30 minutes. I was wondering, but of course I'm in the hands of you judges and, and you know how to do these things. So <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for that. Before closing, just let me say a few words because we don't have the time, I think that some words are important. Equity, uh, course action, climate justice, responsibility, and most of all, ambition. Ambition to do better, ambition to tackle this crisis, and ambition to have always better course that take action to help us to achieve climate justice. So thank you very much. And I give the floor back to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Gretel, um, for sharing so efficiently, elegantly, uh, eloquently this session. Uh, hola, Justice Barroso. Helen was silent, Justice Majid. Aloha, uh, Justice Wilson. The time has come for us to take a short break, uh, about 10 minute break before we reconvene. Uh, the next session, therefore, that we start 10 minutes from now is a session of the current expert panels. We'll have an expert panel advancing climate mitigation worldwide. We have a round table accelerating transition by closing the climate governance gap. We have an expert panel promoting climate action through Europe, America's trade agreements, a fourth one round table addressing loss and damage, liability and compensation within the development paradigms. And uh, as you can see, it is quite a healthy uh, array of uh, round tables. They are taking place in different Zoom rooms that are named after uh, different clubs as well as the uh, city of Cairo, of course, we have the Cairo Forum, the Durban Forum, the um, Paris Gallery, and the Marrakesh uh, Seminar Room, as uh, you can imagine, I'm particularly fond of. So Terras will be first playing a video from uh, Justice Antonio, our dear friend, Chair Emeritus uh, of the IUCN Work Commission on Environmental Law, before we move to the break. Thank you very much. I don't know if it's just me. It seems to be perhaps a sound issue. I can see the video fine, but I cannot seem to hear it. Perhaps it is just me. If so, please go ahead. If it's a bit more than me, we might want to uh, check the no, sound. No, I, I don't hear either. Okay, thank you. Let us uh, double check the sound. Thank you for your understanding. We have a brilliant team uh, that is supporting uh, this event. Thank you. We will perhaps include Judge Benjamin in the later session once the sound has been resolved. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you to our judges and Dr. Gretel for a wonderful chairing and warmest of thanks to our opening speakers, 
Iman, thank you for guiding us through despite the internet conditions in the blue zone of COP27. And we look forward in just a few minutes to the starting of the first four substantive sessions. Thank you.